Welcome to today's TSN's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar will address creating a fascinating marketplace for your attendees. You can submit a question at any time. Alternatively, you can join the conversation and ask a question on Twitter at pound TSNN webinar. Now, Arlene Shows, Marketing Manager for TSNN, would like to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for TSNN's last webinar for 2012. We will continue to deliver complimentary monthly webinars in 2013, so stay tuned for hot topics to come. We are committed to offering valuable content on a monthly basis to our subscribers. We would like to thank our sponsors today, MCCA, Advantage Boston, and OnStream Media. They continue to help us deliver these educational topics to you. If you have attended any of TSNN's recent webinars, you may have noticed they were brought to you by OnStream Media, the leader in multimedia webinar and webcasting services. Did you know that the same technology can help you get better results for your own organization? OnStream's virtual event solutions can connect you with colleagues and customers, extend the value of your events, and boost profits. Webinars and webcasts provide a platform for branded virtual events that can enhance the value of a live show or operate as a single revenue generating event. For a free demo and to learn more about how OnStream webinars and webcasts bring measurable ROI, visit OnStreamMedia.com. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Dana frecker -Duty. She is the Vice President of Corporate Communications for the Expo Group. If you are on Twitter, Dana's hashtag is at the Expo Group. Dana, take it away. Thank you, Arlene. Thanks, all of you, for taking time out of your lunch to be with us today. I am very excited to be talking with you and bringing you a few ideas and some things to think about. I also have two uh, special ladies who are involved with their own shows creating fascinating experiences, and we'll hear from them in just a little bit. But really, I wanted to kick this off by asking, what is fascinating? It's a word that gets thrown around every once in a while. And I think the best definition came from Sally Hogshead. She spoke at this year's PCMA, if any of you remember her from that conference. But the definition that I have here, fascination is an intense emotional focus. When customers are fascinated by you and your message, they're more likely to trust, believe, and respect you. And I think it's such a powerful thing to have an intense emotional focus on your brand, on your association, on your show, because then you are able to retain attendees, you're able to retain exhibitors, and create fascinating experiences that keep people coming back to you. One of the tricks is determining what your community finds fascinating. It's not necessarily enough for you or your staff to be fascinated with it. I think when we start talking about intense emotional attractions, it's really an appeal to basic human nature. It's emotional, so sometimes it's very hard to measure, which sometimes gets those number crunchers all upset. But really, it starts with discovery. I have some images here. I think most of us know that kid or remember that kid from elementary school who's just obsessed with dinosaurs. Maybe it was you. Maybe it's your child right now. But they wanted to know every single thing about every single dinosaur, what their types were, whether they were omnivores or herbivores or whatever they ate. And then, of course, we all know those people who watch The Simpsons every Sunday at 6 o'clock Central Time for the last, what, 25 years? The, those are things that people become fascinated with. It cr creates an emotional connection between them and dinosaurs or history or the Simpsons. And when I say it starts with discovery, I have a picture here of my nephew. And I really want for you to think back. You'll see some pictures of children kind of throughout this presentation. But I really believe that finding what your community thinks is fascinating, it starts with discovery. This is my nephew. He's less than a year old. And what does he want at Christmas time? He wants to know what that bow tastes like, smells like, feels like, sounds like when he crunches it up. And so that's something that can help you determine what you're doing with fascinating experiences on your show floor. When that starts to translate into an event arena, 
it's important to remember that you can move your audience. That's a quote from Joe English of Intel Corp. And really that's his goal and his role with Intel Corporation, is he creates events that can move his audience he creates experiences that create an emotional connection between the audience and the Intel brand. He's also always asking himself, what can we do to mix it up? And when we start talking about creating fascinating experiences for your attendees, a lot of what people find is fascinating is new. You know, think about that nine-month-old baby. Everything in the world is new to them. Those Christmas bows were brand new to my little nephew. Think about what is new that you can present to your attendees that will get their brain thinking in a different direction. Kind of along those same lines, do you remember show and tell? I think a lot of us had show and tell experiences in our daycares or in our school settings. It was a great part of kindergarten, you brought something from home, you showed it to everyone. There was a giving and a receiving. We were interacting with each other. And really when you think about it, what is a trade show floor if it's not a show and tell between your exhibitors and your attendees? Show me what's new. Show me what I can do with this. Tell me how this can make my job easier. When we think about show and tell, engaging the senses, that interaction. Everybody was always very enthusiastic and it was a very sincere experience. So I think that show and tell is something, again, that we can remind ourselves of those kinds of experiences that we had when we were children when we were discovering something new. All of those can lead up to some fascinating experiences. And it, I've had questions before of, okay, how do I find out? If I'm supposed to be finding out what my community thinks is fascinating, whether they like dinosaurs or the Simpsons or whatever the case may be, how do I do that? Really, it's four easy steps, and they're very general, but listen, read, watch, and study. I think listening to your community, listening to what your attendees are talking about, Following, you know, if there's certain blog, if you do have a blog and there's certain posts that are getting a lot of attention, if you notice that there's something going on in town when your show is in town and they're very attracted to that or they want more information, just listening and reading about them and watching them on site and how they react. Pinterest is a fun new way to get in and see what people are pinning about. I see a lot of things in Pinterest where they're very personal pins that people start, it's kind of like collecting. You can easily discover what people are interested in, what they find fascinating on Pinterest. So all of those social media tools can aid us in discovering what our community finds fascinating. Also make sure you study. More importantly sometimes than those quantitative evaluations that we all do, what about the qualitative answers? How are you getting out that information that can't necessarily be checked off in an ABC answer form. Try and collect those. We just heard um, an idea from um, one marketing director who's doing a tweet chat, again, using that social media channel to discover what their community finds fascinating. And I wanted to um, bring attention to a show who did that just recently. Alicia Balanek is the Senior Director of Trade Shows and Events for IPC. And I, we've asked Alicia to join us today. Can you tell us a little bit about the pictures that we're seeing here, Alicia, and how you started talking with your attendees about what they wanted to see for their keynote? Sure, I'd be happy to, Dana. Um, IPC has been trying to um, to have that emotional connection that Dana's been talking about it, and we found it very successful. Uh, our attendees are all engineer types, uh, they're introverts, and I can compare them, if anybody watches the show, The Big Bang Theory, that is our attendee audience. So it's very difficult to find and to tap into what sparks their creativity, who they'd be interested in. And one person, or actually two people, that we were very successful with is uh, Steve Wozniak, who is the co-founder of Apple Computer, and also William Shatner. Um, Wozniak, our attendees revere him. They are, yeah, Steve Wozniak is our attendee's idol. And to be able to bring that emotional connection and allow our attendees to meet him in person was so rewarding for me personally and also for our organization. Many people thanked me afterwards uh, to be able to have that opportunity to shake his hand and actually have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. 
And also, uh, our attendees are also Star Trek uh, Trekkie types, and we were able to bring them none other than William Shatner. Uh, we had standing room only for that event. It was the highest attendance in the last 10 years of our event. And again, just the overwhelming uh, positiveness and thankfulness of our attendees to be able to bring them these, these celebrity types and these people that they looked up to years after years was really rewarding and successful for our organization. I really want to point out how um, at IPC Apex Expo, um, when I first talked with you, Alicia, you were struggling with why people were not coming to the keynote in droves. And this, you really kind of keyed in as a solution for your organization to pull people in to the keynote. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I mean, again, it's, it's a challenging audience to find the right fit for. Um, it, we did make a significant in investment in both of these speakers, but in the long run, it paid off. Um, we, we built our attendance up. We had happy exhibitors and happy attendees. And it, again, we had that emotional connection with them. And now when they look back and they have that signed autograph copy of both Wozniak and Shatner's book on their desk, they have the connection to IPC, which in the end is, is, is successful for us. Right, they're never going to forget that they had that fascinating experience at, at your event. That's correct. We also have with us Molly Merez, and don't forget you can submit questions um, or chat with each other um, through your platform here from OnStream. But Molly Merez is the Executive Director with Ticket Summit, and she has a few um, experiences that her show has created for attendees that uh, she is going to share with us. And the first one here is a guy who looks like he's won stuff, Molly. Yes, he definitely did. This is um, an attendee who won $100 worth of gift certificates um, through one of our sponsors, Restaurant.com. So this was part of an activity that we integrated recently at our last show to really get kind of the brain juice is flowing in the morning. Um, the crowd that comes to our conference, they're definitely night owls. Um, so even to say a 9 a.m. breakfast that goes through 10 is, is still kind of late for them. So to make breakfast more exciting, what we did was we integrated a breakfast trivia, both on the industry itself, because the industry that our event caters to is ticketing and live entertainment. So we had trivia questions on the industry, um, but also Las Vegas. Because part of what you know, I see our show as uh, as a meeting planner is drawing attention to the destination, and our show is in Las Vegas, Nevada. So we had all kinds of trivia about the Bellagio, which was our host hotel, the city, the Las Vegas Strip, um, you know, history um, about the different hotels and so forth. And so for the contestants who won the correct answers, that we had all kinds of exciting prizes. Uh, for example, these coupons for restaurant.com was just one of them. We had gift cards from Macy's, uh, some were free tickets to shows. So we definitely integrated breakfast trivia as a way to make it more exciting, and it turned out to be really quite successful in getting people engaged. I love that you were able to create those fascinating experiences. And again, don't overlook the fact that this was also a benefit to Ticket Summit organizers because you got your attendees up and moving and intellectually, I guess you could say, involved yeah. early, right off the bat. Exactly, because then once they, the questions got started, they wanted to know what they could win next and see what the prizes were. Um, so this second picture uh, is our closing gala. So as part of the closing events that we have on the third and final day of the conference, we have uh, a signature closing gala. This one was hosted at the bank. Uh, we posted it previously at the Tau in the Venetian uh, Resort Hotel Casino. So networking is a really, really huge and essential part of our event. Uh, we do a survey following each conference to just make sure we always stay in tune in terms of what our attendees want, what topics they want for the sessions, whether they want more or less networking time, uh, and also even the format in which they'd like to have it. And across the board, they all just wanted more and more networking time. So this is just one of the many evening events that we have. Our conference is three days long. And so for each of the nights, 
we that we have uh, at least one major networking event where people can you know just hang out, have cocktails, you know, and, and and so forth to really just build build relationships, you know, across the industry. Uh, even extended in our schedule, making sure that the breakfasts are two hours long, that lunches are one and a half hours long, and definitely uh, little mini breaks between the different uh, panel and keynote sessions. So that way people have enough time for the trade show and enough time for coffee breaks. But the evening events are also essential. And since most people are coming from outside of Las Vegas, they don't know really what to do. So they rely on us heavily in terms of what to do and where to go. So by already having planned evening events such as this one, it really helps them just continue to rebuild those relationships, get to know the folks in the crowd, and just overall have a really great time. Very cool. And I will um, reiterate, because sometimes I have that um, great ability to point out the obvious, but a lot of us have keynotes, and a lot of us have receptions, and a lot of us have networking luncheons. But think about the way that Alicia and Molly just described that they tied these events specifically to what their attendees were needing, specifically involving what was going to be fascinating to their attendees to strengthen their community base and hence their um, entire show, really. So Molly, tell us about these three guys. This, this is a fun one. This is a fun one. So. Um, as part of the trade show activities, we had a, a, a station set up specifically for photo ops, some more serious, but definitely some more fun. Uh, and our staff of photographers managed to catch this photo with this team of guys with these amazing <laughs> wacky glasses. <laughs> and what we did after the show, so that the buzz would not die, was to have a caption contest. Because what do people normally want to see after a show? Well, they want pictures. They want video. They, they want to remember the good times. And so part of what we do is uh, we update our media hub. So I think it's on that website has a media hub where one can download pictures, videos, presentations, so forth from what happened at the show. But to build even greater buzz, we held a caption contest the month following the show where we picked the, the wackiest pictures and send it out to our Twitter followers and say, hey, you know, create a, a, a caption and the funniest one will win. And so for an entire month, we had different prizes each week with different photos. This was just one of, of four to five different photos that we were featuring uh, during the month of, of August for our, our caption contest. And it was a lot of fun because it brought back really great memories. And it also allowed us to let the show continue to live beyond the three days. Because let's face it, even you know, a three-day event is long. A lot of conferences are just one to two. Anything beyond three is definitely considered you know, a longer event. But it's still only three days. And so by integrating social media and then, and then weaving these memories into a more a continued interactive experience and let the show, in a way, live on but also um, capture intrigue of people who have not been to the show and say, oh, you know, these are the things that happen at the show and the people that come and the fun that we have. And, and it helps really draw more attendees as well. So it's a crowd pleaser for those who came. And it's a really great way to draw attendees for future shows. I love it because these guys clearly, well, I'm going to make an assumption here, but I don't think they wear these purple glasses all the time. I don't so think so. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly they were fascinated with what was going on here, that they were having such a good time. They were willing to put on these purple glasses and hold up their prizes and their, you know, things, yep. items that they had just procured, um, you know, and, and share with everyone in your community that they were having a great time at Ticket Summit. Yeah, yeah, and actually the, the V-Card prizes, that was, again, one of our sponsors. V-Theater was giving away um, free tickets and special VIP packages, and so they were just not only excited about being in Las Vegas, but the fact that they won this special raffle. So if you're wondering how Molly and Elisa knew that they had hit on something, how do you know when you've created a fascinating experience? And I use this uh, Supreme Court opinion quote. Um, it's kind of like porn. You know it when you see it. So when you see three guys willing to put on purple glasses, 
um, and be photographed for your show, you can pretty much assure yourself that you've created a fascinating experience. When Alicia got responses from her attendees talking about how valuable it was to them personally to shake hands with Steve Wozniak, that's when she knew that she had hit upon a fascinating experience. So some of you may be thinking how this fits into your business plan and really why do you want to be fascinating. I think we need to remember that there are a lot of brands nowadays that have raised society's expectations for the experiences that we're having just in our everyday life. You're not competing against a um, competitive show when it comes to your registration system or your website. You're competing against Amazon and how easy it is for people you know, to do that one click order and you're done. You know? Your experience from registration, traveling to the show, being at the show, being in those conference sessions, visiting with those exhibitors, all of those experiences tied up into the whole experience of your event is competing for people's time and you're competing with people who are inspiring loyalty and they're bringing back repeat customers by entertaining, making it easy, and creating fascinating experiences. You know, we see this line in the bottom picture of these people lined up to, you know, buy their new Apple iPhone. That's what you want. You want people who are ready for the next iteration of your event. You don't want to be in that situation where people think it's okay for, for them to skip a year of your annual meeting, or people think it's okay to just be a member and not be coming to your show every single iteration. How can you create fascinating experiences that tie directly to your bottom line through your retained attendees and attracting new attendees? And <clears throat> that kind of leads us to this next discussion. Uh, Britton Jones, um, one of the um, business journal show is Motor Manhattan. This is an image from that show. I want you to keep your eye on that white carpet. Uh, Britton Jones, uh, this is a quote that he attributed to Galen Poss. As soon as you're producing the same old show, you're in decline. We're really in this situation now where you can throw that old saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it. You can throw that saying right out the window. It is broken if you're not changing it. If you're producing just the same old show, you're in decline. I think some of us saw that over the last few years, and we really, some of us learned some hard lessons, some show organizers did, and then others of us were able to take advantage of those opportunities and create those fascinating experiences, create something new and exciting that got those attendees coming back for more. <clears throat> I told you to keep your eye on that white carpet. This is not the floor plan for Moda Manhattan. But I never want you to underestimate the power of your floor plan in creating fascinating experiences for your attendees. This is something that um, our floor plan designer, you know, kind of just created for me. But look at how you're setting up your floor plans and how you are incentivizing your attendees to go into this rote mode where they're just going up and down these you know, square aisles. What would happen if you created these diagonal aisles leading into a fantastic experience at the center of your show floor? What if you had these boulevards of discovery, right? Remember my nephew with those bows? It was something new. He hadn't experienced those bows before. It was his very first Christmas morning. So think about what you're incentivizing when you lay out your floor plan. Would you rather be experiencing life, business, and a trade show in an environment on the top left corner or the bottom right corner, which unfortunately is what most of our floor plans look like? You know, a lot of times we run into oh, the electrical grids are this way, or oh, the, you know, the carpet is, you know, 10 foot wide and, and it's, you know, on a straight line. Think really about how your floor plan can get people out of their same old, same old thinking and how you can use spaces on your show floor to incentivize certain activities. A great question just came in from Donna Kastner, thank you, Donna. 
where are some of the best places to find or borrow new ideas for fascinating experiences? I think a lot of it is in retail. Look at a retail floor plan. You know, you have your exciting, you know, big, big box retailers at the mall and then all the little kiosks and all these little things in between. Get out and about. Think about even just the fun festivals that your community has. Think about the town square and how maybe your town all flocks on the weekends, you know, to go shopping or they need to take care of their business or where are the meeting places in your community, physic in your physical community, your town or your city or your county where people are coming together. Kind of keeping on with that theme is um, another of the TSNN fastest growing shows this year was Super Zoo. And this is their floor plan for their show coming up this summer. But you'll notice it's laid out linearly, but look at all the color that's involved here, OK? So what Super Zoo does is they've created neighborhoods, OK? And you'll see them highlighted here on their floor plan to the left. And a lot of us have tried, you know, new product showcases or international pavilion or, you know, kind of segmenting, you know, different things along the show floor. Super Zoo really takes it to another level and they d use decor to create these neighborhood fields. Excuse me, these neighborhood feel, the neighbor, you know, the atmosphere of a different neighborhood. So, you know, their Rodeo Drive neighborhood that's pictured here they have black carpet, they have a wide aisle, they have this park-like atmosphere. And that is where their exhibitors who market um, pet products, you know, you see like the carriers and some of these dog sweaters and there's a little Santa Claus sweater over there on the far left. But they take that floor plan and when people are walking through this show, the decor signals this is something different the shape of the floor plan signals this is something different. So it's not just that up and down every aisle is the same. You'll notice here this is their new product showcase area. Okay, this is for new products. And look in this picture how jammed that aisle is. Well, what does that say to the attendee's brain? What it says to their brain is, wow, there's so much new stuff here at SuperZoo that they can't even fit it all in, right? They didn't go with the 10-foot aisle, which is exactly like the aisles, you know, over there where all the other exhibitors are. This new product showcase has a super skinny aisle, and it creates that feeling of, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff. I can't believe it. Obviously, every new vendor is giving away their, or excuse me, coming to SuperZoo and offering up their wares. So it kind of just by the mere physical aspect, the mere layout of this floor plan, they create that atmosphere for attendees to think that. Also, you know, a good question has come in on inspiring exhibitors to be more fascinating. So how, as a show organizer, um, do you have that conversation or how do you encourage your exhibitors to do new and interesting things? Um, I've talked to several exhibitors and show organizers about this very thing because sometimes it comes back to a controversial relationship. But y your exhibit sales team needs to be in a position where they're able to have those conversations. Certainly, if you're trying something new on the show floor, your exhibitor relations team needs to be able to share that with your exhibitors and say, hey, we're trying this. What is new that you could try? Or maybe if you want to create a new and exciting experience on your show floor, you approach a few of your exhibitors and say, hey, would you like to get in on the ground floor with this, right? Because, you know, our co the company I work for also has a custom exhibits division, so I know that corporations are asking these very same questions. It's not just show organizers that want to create fascinating experiences. The corporations that are designing the booths and exhibiting on your show floor, they don't want the same old, same old either. They want to be able to create a fascinating experience. They're looking for new kinds of sponsorships and ways to be involved in your show. I think the best way you can inspire, ex inspire exhibitors to be more fascinating is to make your show more fascinating in general, right? Kind of that all, you know, ships rise with the tide. Um, 
it, it helps if you could have a sheet. I know there were some great ideas. We have a weekly chat called Expo Chat. It's on Twitter. And if you go to um, expochat.wordpress.com, there's an archive of the chat yesterday. We kind of spoke about these exact same things, and there are some great ideas in there on how you can inspire exhibitors to be more fascinating, how you can create new and different experiences on your show floor. So that's a little bit of a supplement to our discussion here today. And if any of you want to ask some more questions about that, um, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, Molly and Alicia, if you have any ideas on how you've inspired your own exhibitors, please feel free to jump in. If anyone has a super great idea and they don't want to ask a question, go ahead and put it in the chat or put it on the Twitter on the TSNN webinar hashtag so that we can share uh, and be part of this conversation ongoing with each other. The address again, if you want to pull up the archive for that expo chat, it's expochat.wordpress.com. And it's really just a, commu a very loose community of people involved in the exhibition. You know, we're not tied to any one company or any one idea. It's just a time that we get together on Wednesdays to chat about issues that are facing our industry and kind of help each other be better at our jobs. So when we talk about floor plans, which is one of my favorite things to talk about lately. One of my clients is the association, um, for, it's for public works executives, the American Public Works Association. So we had a great presentation on the show floor from a conference speaker. And he talked about this concept called a Voonerf. And it's a Dutch word, and it's used um, in city planning. And I love, like you said, Donna, there are a lot of places where you can borrow ideas. And this is something that I borrowed from seeing that Public Works Association speech um, and talking with the gentleman who is the Public Works Director um, for a city up in Wisconsin. But this whole concept of a Vooner um, he told the story like this. He's in charge of the Public Works Department. A lot of accidents were occurring at a certain intersection in his city. And he had read about Voonerfs and, you know, how to create, you know, different types of roadways. So what he did was he got his newspaper and his lawn chair, and he went and he sat in the very center of that traffic intersection. And he had lived to tell this story, so we were all, you know, immediately assured that everything was okay. But the great part about this is he talked about what happened when he did that. So he's sitting there in the middle of the intersection on his lawn chair reading his newspaper. And I don't know about you, but if I would have seen the man sitting there in the middle of the intersection on his lawn chair reading a newspaper, I would have slowed down. And that was really his point, is that it created such a different environment that people slowed down. There was something new, and it sent a trigger to the brain. Whoa, OK, I need to slow down. What's going on here? I need to assess this. What other kinds of information can I take in at this intersection? So instead of just flying through the interse intersection, you know, red, green, red, yellow, green, um, people were slowing down and taking in a little bit more information about what was going on. And if you've ever driven home from your office and not remembered the last two miles, y you'll recognize how powerful it can be to have something different, right? To have a guy in the middle of an intersection reading his newspaper on a lawn chair, right? Your brain doesn't go into that auto, auto mode when there's something new and something different. And I really think that this concept of a Vooner could be used quite effectively in the trade show hall. So it wasn't just that up and down, up and down, up and down. So think about that. It's a fun word to say. I could totally be saying it wrong, but I do think it's a fun concept that translates from public works planning directly into exhibition planning. And I even, I pulled this um, 
off the internet, you look at this map and you kind of wonder, is that a city or is that a floor plan uh, for an exhibition, right? And it's actually the city of Montreal. But you can see how not everything is laid out linearly. You know, there's that big boulevard to discovery right there along the river or perpendicular to the river. The aisles, some of them are skinny and some of them are wide. There's community spaces right down the center. Um, so kind of thinking about those types of layouts. But we also need to think about what kinds of activities or experiences we can have to make that trade show box, that floor, more fascinating. These are just quick, you know, off-the-cuff generalizations. We're seeing a lot of shows starting to do material handling packages. What is the benefit of that? It brings more exhibitor equipment into the show floor, right? So when you think about other kinds of wow experiences, there's a lot of wow experiences that I've witnessed that are created by having the actual equipment on the show floor. Demonstrations, showdowns. Um, we saw a lot of flash mobs. Guess what? We're not seeing so many flash mobs anymore, right? So again, you have to keep in tune with what your community finds fascinating. A lot of people were really hip on those flash mobs two years ago. Now, not so much, right? So you really need to see, is your community ahead? Is your community behind regular society? Are they kind of like at the edge of pop culture? Or are they kind of lagging? And that's still a valuable experience for them. Building and training events, any kinds of hands-on event. Hybrid events, streaming, education. A lot of times, technology is what creates that shiny, blingy thing that can make a trade show box more fascinating. And again, when you think about creating that trade show box and making it more fascinating, the goal there, again, remember that definition from Sally Hogshead, fascinating means intense emotional focus, can lead to trust, and then trust leads to your bottom line. Your goal is retaining your attendees, getting them to talk about you, making it so that they feel they have to come every single time. This was um, another example of a town hall. We had a question come in about um, other wow experiences that you've witnessed um, this year. I've seen some really wow experiences when shows take the little spaces that have gotten spread out over the show floor over the last few decades and put them into one central space, OK? And in that central space, they really are thinking about what they're incentivizing. Here at Coverings, they were incentivizing the use of social media. They wanted their attendees to learn how to do it. They wanted them to do it right from the show floor. They really were harnessing the power of that social media to get the word out. Another thing I like to talk about is harnessing the power of your rock stars, right? So this guy in the blue shirt, he we don't know him from Mick Jagger, right? We don't know who he is compared to Adam Levine, but he's a rock star in this community, right? What if you took that rock star that was talking in your conference and brought them into the show floor and created a space where those people could meet? I've, I've done it one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we're talking, some people are calling those office hours. What if you had your conference speakers come in and do office hours? Like if you were in college, you know, the professor was there from, you know, 2 to 4 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You know, the time was set and people could just stop by. Um, I talked to two people at IAWE Expo Expo who were using that concept to great positive response from their attendee community, okay? These small group discussions. You know, we're not locking them away to have small group discussions in meeting rooms. This is open to the show floor, okay? So people can come by, they can learn a little bit, and then they keep shopping. So remember when you talk about education on the show floor, if anyone has been burned or had complaints from their exhibitors, I'm not advocating for you to have a, you know, 
50 to 150 seat theater on your show floor where you give one hour, you know, sessions. That's education on the show floor, but it's not benefiting your attendees and exhibitors as much as short snippets of education right out in the open could benefit them. It builds buzz. It gets people talking about you, and it gets them moving through your show floor. There's nothing I hate worse than those big theaters, and I watch the attendees. They walk down the hall. They go and hide in the theater for a few hours, and then they walk back out. You want to create, work with your conference staff, work with your marketing staff. Who are those rock stars? How can you harness them and bring them into the show floor for the benefit of your attendees and your exhibitors? by crafting short little educational sessions. I've talked with several people who are doing this in different iter you know, iterations and have ha are having some great success with it. How can you engage the senses? Again, just reiterating on that, on that list of six things. Can you have demonstration areas? What can you build on the show floor? How can you incentivize your exhibitors to bring their actual equipment to the show floor? How, you know, we're hearing a lot more about engaging the senses on the show floor. How can you engage those other senses like smell and sound and touch and feel, right? It's not enough just to see. Remember, we have five senses. I, apparently, some people have a six, but, but that's not me. Think about how you can bring the outside in and take the inside out. So what I mean by that is how can you capture what's happening on your show floor? We talk a lot about content capture. How can you capture that and send it out in a way that advertises and markets how fascinating your show floor box is? why people, not only do they want to come to your conference for awesome educational opportunities, but they want to come because your show floor is a fascinating place to be. And when your show floor is a fascinating place to be, your exhibitors reap the benefits of that by having that higher traffic and their brains are more engaged. Okay. Think about how you can build a virtual audience and maybe do this event here that um, we helped a client produce was live streaming short snippets of, of conference education directly from the show floor. This is a model that has worked for several people. When you look at a hybrid event, think about how you can add and layer in that virtual audience at the same time that you're having your live event. That's, you know, bringing the outside in and making them feel part of your event. I would really love to hear, again, it's, I think it's pretty easy there to just chat um, what you've seen at other shows, at your own show. You know, and a question that we did receive was, how can you get attendees excited before the event through your marketing materials, webinars, et cetera? And that is kind of a reminder to people is don't forget to market that you are doing this activity, right? And maybe you market it in a different way. Talk to your marketing team. Have they been wanting to try something new? Have they been wanting to try and start a blog about something or use video for a certain purpose? Maybe this is the perfect opportunity for you to let them take it and run with it, right? And make it all a little bit new. But don't forget, not only marketing ahead of time, um, so that they want to come and take part in that experience on your show, but also don't forget to market it at the show, right? Sometimes we're so afraid of using paper or we, you know, have this mobile app, sometimes we forget that it's easy to have a little handout that says, hey, this exciting thing is happening. As long as there's benefit and value to the attendee, they're welcome, they usually welcome those messages. So really what it comes down to is that we uh, want you to be fascinating, right? Because then your customers, your clients are focused on you intensely and emotionally. And that then becomes a hard habit to break. 
these pictures here are just little reminders of how to create experiences that will make your attendees remember their time at your event, that will help them to open up their brains to new and different ideas, and to really follow um, that childhood need to discover and um, experience new things. And we're going to open up, um, I think, Arlene, if there's time for questions, I think we saved some time here at the end, so we'd love to take some questions, and I'm going to take a drink of water. So one question um, I'll take, and then it looks, Alicia, like we have a question for you. Um, what about gamification? Um, that is a good question. Again, is that something that your attendees are interested in? Is that something that they would find fascinating? Actually, um, that's a... That's a great question. We actually have a IPC, our organization is also a standards-based organization, and one of our standards is uh, soldering the components and the pieces onto the circuit board. And we actually have an international worldwide championship for our hand soldering competition, which is in conjunction with the standard we produce. So not only does it involve uh, the, the competitiveness nature and the technical aspect of uh, the standard in our attendees, but it also brings awareness to our standards and uh, promotes our certification programs. So that, yes, that is something that, that we do do and have been very successful at. Awesome. So do they, like, get crowned or given a medal or kind of how do you we run actually, that program? We have regional championships throughout the world, throughout our events, and then we'll have a international championship at our large show in February in San Diego where we will fly people from India, China, um, Europe, and uh, we had a small regional show in the Midwest earlier this year, and they'll all compete against each other, and we give them free airfare, and, you know, they get, um, you know, of course, bragging rights, and then a nice certificate and a trophy, and, of course, some cash prizes. Very cool. And, you know, that kind of ties in. It just made me think, um, you know, we, we had that question about encouraging your exhibitors to do um, fascinating things as well. I've seen video of an exhibitor, I want to say it was CES, I'm not sure, but having the video game championships or typing championships right on the show floor in their booth. Um, so I, lo I love that, that you're doing that because it does, it gets into those competitive uh, – <laughs> Another question, Alicia, I don't know if you can um, answer this, is how did you go about getting Shatner and Wozniak to keynote? Um, we hire a professional speakers bureau, which has been absolutely wonderful to work with. We've been working with them for a number of years now, so they really know our audience, and they're able to provide us with some with some good suggestions. And um, the last couple of years, we engaged our audience and actually had them vote to, for who they wanted to hear. And you know, we had uh, you know John Landau was on the the ticket. Uh, Wozniak um, and the several other technical type speakers and we engaged our attendees by having them vote and they actually selected the keynote. So, you know, when you engage people, you know more about what they want to hear and that's how you're going to be more successful because you're hearing from your member membership database on who they'd like to see. Um, another question, Alicia, did you, you said that, you know, you had increased um, what you paid for keynote speakers to accommodate the two of them in particular. Did you drop something to accommodate that or rework anything budget-wise? You know, we always try to, you know, watch our expenses and cut where we can, uh, but our show was in Las Vegas for four consecutive years, and we were moving back to San Diego, and 49% of our audience comes from San Diego, so we were actually bringing the show in their backyard. Wow. So we knew just because of that we would have increased attendance, which would hopefully increase our revenue. So we did spend a little bit more than what we wanted to, but in the end we had a 26% increase in attendance that year. So it was a win-win for everyone. Awesome. We're winding down in the last few minutes to ask questions.
So another thing while we're on the um, keynote topic, what um, a question came in, and I know that I don't know the answer to this, what other perfect matches have I seen at shows where someone just really taps into what is fascinating their audience? Um, don't know if I can answer that one, um, but I do know that when your keynote speaker, think about how they can be brought into the show floor. You know, we talked about harnessing the power of your rock stars. You know, obviously if you're bringing in a keynoter who has the power to move your community, how can you create an atmosphere on the show floor where they would be welcome? Um, to engage in one of those activities. You know, maybe your keynoter comes in and they're the judge of your cooking competition. Or maybe your keynoter comes in and does, you know, some of those professor office hours that I mentioned. Um, think about how you can, again, bridge that gap between the conference and exhi exhibition. Dana, uh, this is Molly Mraz, if I could just chime in on that as well. Um, I've been I've been reading some of the the questions and it and it really um, has a lot to do with knowing your audience, um, which I'll speak about in, in about ten seconds. But you know, on the keynote thing, uh, something we did at our last show, uh, one of the keynote speakers, because we had we had two different ones, but one of them actually spent the whole morning at one of our booths. So Ticket Summit cool. had its own booth at the swap swap shop where we had a bagel game. So before his keynote, he actually uh, decided to actually then like challenge other attendees to play bagel against him and just strike up conversation. And basically, by the time his keynote started, which was around one one thirty or two o'clock, he had essentially met at least thirty percent of the people at the show because he was at the booth playing bagel games and handing out prizes uh, awesome. and so forth. So it was a great networking opportunity for him, but it also made people more excited about the keynote because they'd already had the chance to talk with him because he'd, he'd be giving them little previews of what he was going to be talking about. So it was it was great to kind of weave him in on the trade show floor that way. Right. Um, and was that written into his contract, Molly, or was it something no, that he it just was wanted not. to do? No, it was It was absolutely volunteer. And I definitely said to him, you know, you absolutely don't need to do that. You're essentially, if you're standing by our booth, it's like you're promoting our show. You know, I want to make sure you're still promoting your own brand. <laughs> and but no, he he wanted to do that because since our that booth was a, a central location on the trade show floor, he just wanted to be in a spot where he could essentially meet as many people as possible before the keynote. Cool. Yeah, it was absolutely volunteer, and he was such a good sport about it, and, and everyone was just all the more excited to watch him speak at, after lunch. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I know people have lots of questions about marketing ideas and so forth. Th there are certainly a lot of things that can be done, but I'll just say that it really has to do with knowing your audience. I could give ideas, but what works for me certainly wouldn't mm -hmm. work for so a conference on tiles or a conference on children's toys. Um, what, I w what I would strongly urge, I'm, I'm a person who loves data. I, I love crunching numbers. I like building strategies based on what people actually say they want. So if you're currently not doing a survey, or you're not asking your attendees questions at all, that's if, that, if there's one thing I could urge everyone on this webinar to do is to uh, do a survey after each show. There's even quicker ways of doing it now through conference mobile apps. You can rate sessions instantly, rate them one to five stars, write notes, email the conference manager with your immediate reaction. Um, if, you, for, if you can't afford to have a mobile app at the show, uh, surveymonkey.com is a wonderful, wonderful, extremely cost-effective tool to design your own survey where you can ask people anything from how they like the sessions to the food to the layout of the floor plan. Um, we've designed a lot of strategies based on survey uh, responses, even to the length of the sessions, the topics that we choose, uh, even how people want to receive mail or email, the frequency, and so forth. Because people are always asking themselves, oh, am I annoying them if I'm sending them too much email or too little? Well, ask them, how often do you want to hear from us? Right. You know, it's, it's as easy as right. that. Um, even things like, for example, at least 30% of our audience actually prefers to be contacted by phone because they say that they receive so much email. They would actually prefer to 
talk with someone about the show rather than get an email that they're likely to delete. So actually before the show, we have a huge um, outbound uh, phone call effort in order to really build that excitement before the show because that's what they've actually told us they prefer and, and we appreciate it and they appreciate it as well. So it really comes down to knowing your audience and they're very easy tools out there so you can build surveys and get the data that you need. Right. And it sounded, uh, Molly, like you had um, at least one of your keynotes was near the end of the event. Um, right. So what we try to do in order to maximize networking time is that after lunch we have a keynote session and, and either we have just one short session following it or actually none at all so that way we have strictly trade show hours. Okay. So that way um, it's completely unobstructed networking time because a lot of the, and again it goes down to catering to your audience, a lot of the folks who are exhibitors um, are technology providers which means that their demos can run anything from 15 minutes to one hour. So if your trade show hours um, are very little, a person basically only has time to sit through, let's say, one, maybe two demos a day. Right, right. So we definitely want to make sure that then trade show hours are longer. Um, and actually for our upcoming show now in July, uh, there, there will actually be no sessions after the keynote, so that way trade show hours will go longer instead of from 3.30 to 5 in the afternoon, they'll go from 2.30 to 5. So, yeah. And I think that, that question had, had come in, um, thank you, Claudia. I think that might be something that you play with and maybe that um, helps lead you to a new experience is really looking at your traffic, you know, your timing patterns of your conference. Maybe you do move the keynote to the end or maybe you have bookend keynotes. Um, but, you know, Dana, can I add the, to that? This is Alicia. Sure. Uh, um, about adding, you know, no one says there's no written rule that you just have to have one keynote for right. your event. Something new that we're trying in February is we want to give that our attendees a reason to come every day, not just on the first day where all the bells and whistles are, are being held. So our upcoming event in February, we actually have a keynote each morning. We have one on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, and, you know, it has a reason where people want to stay throughout the entire event and expand their networking opportunities. So that's just something for the, the group to think about as well, that, you know, think outside the box a little bit. Just because this is a normal show pattern doesn't mean you need to follow that. Right. And I think that's one thing that all of us here um, coming to talk to you today would agree on is just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean you shouldn't um, pick it apart and question it and really look um, at how you can create fascinating uh, experiences and a fascinating marketplace for your attendees. And on that note, I want to thank Trade Show News Network um, for this monthly webinar series. I was excited to hear that we'll continue in 2013. Uh, the recording of this session will be posted on tsnn.com slash webinars. Um, it, it's not immediate, so you know, let us take a breath here, and then um, they'll get that posted, and you can view the archive there. And thanks again to the sponsors of the webinar series, uh, MCCA, Advantage Boston, and on stream media. Thank you all very much. Have a safe and joyful, joyful holiday season. Holiday season.